a fortnight went by between the third interview and the next. Jackie traveled to New York and went out with Bobby. She spent a lot of time with him. Was their relationship platonic or romantic? Today, some tend to believe he was a source of comfort that went beyond the merely spiritual. Bobby was more than just her brother-in-law. He was the brother she'd never had, her friend. Bobby and Jackie were soulmates. I would like to say a few words about the John Fitzgerald. Look forward to retiring. After Bobby's death four years later, she wept. I hate America. John it's Kennedy. killing the Kennedys. So One weekend in September 1963, two months before Dallas, they were in Newport. Jackie was recovering from the death of Patrick, her third child. In pictures from that trip, we can see Ben Bradley, a friend from the Washington Post, accompanied by his wife, Tony, the blonde woman. According to Tony, JFK attempted on several occasions to seduce her. If it could be called seduction, so aggressive was his technique. The other woman is Tony's sister, Mary Pinchot Meyer, the president's most loyal mistress. Jackie can't not know. Especially when she learned that he had spent the night with Mary Meyer, not to mention the succession of women in her husband's bed, from bathing session to siesta, friends of the family, society women, models, actresses, secretaries, and prostitutes. <laughs> Jack compartmentalized his life, his family, his work, his friends, and the part he never revealed, an unbridled sex life. In Puritan America, it was perhaps his dark side. There were so many women in Jack's life, but Jackie didn't say anything about any of these affairs. In one moment of defiance, though, she threw down this challenge. She'd better be wonderful, that mistress of yours, to justify cheating on a woman like me. Instead, Jackie emphasized how discreet her husband was. He'd send her abroad as much as possible so that she could have fun. Go to Italy with your sister, go to New York or Greece. While she was vacationing on Capri in June of 1962, Mimi, an intern at the White House, became the president's mistress at the tender age of 19. Years later, Mimi recounted that Kennedy repeatedly offered her drugs. He would also offer her to his collaborators as a gift. Jackie said of Jack, he doesn't ever cheat in anything. Then she fell silent. She seemed lost in her memories. She took a deep breath, had a drink, and asked, may I say that? Arthur Schlesinger encouraged her. You may say whatever you like, Jackie. But suddenly she reconsidered. No, actually, it's not worth it. She never mentioned how jealous Jack was. 
It is said that Kennedy even demanded paternity tests for their two children, Caroline and John John. He was convinced that his wife behaved as immorally as he did. When she took a trip to Greece in 1963, he instructed Clint Hill, Jackie's bodyguard, to make sure that Onassis didn't get too close. During her final remarks of this session, she talked of what she calls the poison of the presidency. We were completely cut off from the world in the White House and were always the last to hear what everyone was saying about us. Around that time, Jackie had put the house in Glenora up for sale. They never got to live there after all. It was a home just for the two of them, for after the presidency. She couldn't bring herself to settle there without him. She wanted to move to New York, perhaps to follow Bobby, who had decided to run for senator. She wanted to distance her children from the Kennedy clan. Warren Commission hearings to investigate the Kennedy assassination had started. The first to be interrogated was the other widow from Dallas, the wife of Oswald, the presumed assassin. Jackie would soon have her turn. During the fifth interview, Jacqueline Kennedy touched on a sensitive subject, France. I would like to say a few never be a dead John Fitzgerald Kennedy library. I had to believe so strongly that when he ended, should not just be the most comfortable life last. Known for her love of the country, Jackie now, however, painted a harsh and cruel caricature of it during the interview. Throughout his trip to Paris on May 31st, 1961, Kennedy was presented as the guy accompanying Jacqueline Kennedy. The couple won over the French, who found Jackie brilliant and cultivated, and the jubilant crowd welcomed her like a legendary princess. France was the homeland of the Bouviers, Jackie's paternal side of the family. She felt at home there. She'd spent time in Paris during her youth. She adored French fashion designers, the city's architecture, and the great figures of French history. Napoleon, Saint-Simon, Lafayette, and Madame Récamier. As well as a certain Charles de Gaulle, France's liberator. Strangely, three years after this voyage, Jackie seemed to renounce this love. Kennedy's advisor had warned them, de Gaulle is a fascist, an arrogant colonialist, or at best, a Don Quixote who is full of himself. Hence, the meeting between the two leaders proved difficult, fraught with fundamental disagreements, although there was a certain reciprocal admiration. De Gaulle presented himself as Kennedy's friendly yet critical protector. Playing the polite yet curious guest, Kennedy questioned the old general. He pretended to accept his advice, assuring him of his admiration, even going so far as to cite the opening sentence of his memoirs of war, which he paraphrased as, I've always had a certain idea of the United States. Overcome with sorrow, Jackie now admitted that her husband felt nothing but contempt for de Gaulle that she disliked the French just as much as him. He fueled his bitterness. This general was vindictive. His pride had compromised relations with the United States. He was disloyal. A 
Nevertheless, de Gaulle had been an unconditional ally during the Cuban Missile Crisis. In an act of childish spitefulness, she even had all the Cezanne paintings taken down in her private quarters to remove any French presence in the White House. She didn't spear poor Madame de Gaulle either. She had seemed so weary, she seemed to have suffered so much. She sort of drifted about on her own, staring into space. Sitting next to her, Jack tried to talk about something other than embroidered tablecloths. Jackie still chuckled. Once again, it was all about the legend. De Gaulle was supposedly so infatuated with Jackie that he couldn't take his eyes off her throughout the entire stay. In Paris, Jackie showed her seductive side, later recalling without the slightest modesty, I know that the general was interested in me. She did, however, acknowledge a certain gallantry and courtesy in the general's manners. But still, she named her poodle de Gaulle. Choked with sorrow, she closed the interview with this venomous portrait of the old general, who she saw as guilty of having outlived her husband, of still being alive while her husband wasn't. Today in Arlington, an eternal flame burns on the tomb of the assassinated president. Jackie wanted this flame to be just like the one burning at the Arc de Triomphe, and she got that idea from her trip to Paris. In Paris, she insisted on meeting with the very romantic French hero, the writer André Malraux, the de Gaulle's Minister of Culture. She overflowed with adulation, Meeting Malraux was like running an obstacle course in fog at 70 miles an hour. With him, your mind goes back and forth. He is the most fascinating man I've ever spoken with. She presented Kennedy as a worthy conversation partner for Malraux. He had an amazing exchange with my husband, she says. Usually parsimonious with her praise, this time she gave in, effusing. The brilliance of one was reflected in the brilliance of the other. She invited him to the United States on two occasions. Kennedy had asked his wife to serve as liaison between de Gaulle and America, so as not to lose the connection. André Malraux brought the Mona Lisa with him, which was exceptionally borrowed from the Louvre for an exhibition at the National Gallery in Washington. The exhibition had an enormous impact and, in Jackie's eyes, enhanced the splendor of the Kennedy presidency. But Jackie made another gaffe and tactlessly described him and his wife, Madeleine, as being like two sinister crows. Malraux's face was pale and bloated with tears, distorted by nervous tics. André Malraux had just lost his two sons in an accident. She was aware of this, but couldn't help herself. Malraux, she said, worshipped de Gaulle like a spaniel worships its master. De Gaulle would talk down to him, like to a servant, perhaps out of jealousy, because Malraux was too close to me, she added. Speaking slowly, in a rather childish voice, Jackie was cold-bloodedly candid. 
At the end of March 1964, Jackie was faring much better. She took her children to Aspen, taking some time to reflect on history and on her own story. Now she opened up a bit more, allowing the sad and frightened woman hidden under the arrogant lady in pink to emerge. When Jack was president, like a little girl, I thought I'd never be afraid again when falling asleep. She admitted that she dreaded the day when he would no longer be president. He would have become a writer, journalist, or speaker. She had dreamed that Kennedy would be named president of the United States for life. Only he, dazzling and intelligent, could prevent the country going off the rails. She was no doubt still convinced of this. On May 29, 1964, Jackie commemorated her husband's birthday. I would like to say a few will never be a dead John Fitzgerald Kennedy forward to retiring to his life so strongly. Simply or simplistically, she concluded that not a single one of Jack's contemporaries could measure up to him. Churchill, Nehru, Adenauer, Martin Luther King. None was the equal to Jack. Good evening, my fellow citizens. Peace and freedom. The cause of freedom. In a time of danger, in the world of communism, freedom, not coercion, is the wave of the future. And we hope around the world, free to choose their own future. All the way. And we shall win. November 1962. My husband had looked forward to retire. My husband believed so strongly in this that one's aim should not just be this last vision. John who was so intensely involved in life. Following this last interview, Jackie was to be questioned by the Warren Commission about the assassination in Dallas. The questioning lasted 15 minutes. She didn't say anything, or rather, she said she didn't want to know who assassinated him. They'd taken her husband, her hero, away from her and nothing could bring him back. The important thing now was to write the myth. These intimate details were supposed to be kept a secret, to be unveiled 50 years after her death. The image of the radiant lady in pink gives way to the painful face of a woman in black in mourning of herself, who seems to be asking whether, despite appearances, her life has passed her by. Jackie's memories turned sour like bad wine. She awoke from the intoxication of power, and to better sober up, she spewed forth on everything and everyone. Then she looked in the mirror and fixed her face for the face of history. On June 3, 1964, she told Arthur Schlesinger his task was over. She never wrote her memoirs, nor gave any more interviews about her dead husband or life in the White House.